So in uh, September 23rd, 1999, the Mars Climate Orbiter yes. basically crashed. Oh, okay. Y- Isn't y- that cool? You set me up with Mars. I was happy. Yep. And yeah. it crashed. All right. Okay. You don't, you don't remember this? It, it, it kind of, they lost contact with it on the 23rd and it kind of went, eh, what What's, happened? Uh, Boom. And it, okay. It, I might be guessing wildly. I, rem- I, I do remember a, a Pommy one where they were really excited and, and there's shots of be- beardy <laughs> Pommy scientists that all look like I'm the goodies. And then, and then, yeah, they've been waiting years for this and then that's yeah. it. Dead. Was well, that this it? one was all going fine, but then they, they, they basically, it stacked. And the reason it did it was because the original builders, who I think were Lockheed Martin, were doing things in feet and inches, and they sent it to NASA, who were doing it in metric. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so, measurement mattered there. Yeah. They got the units wrong. <laughs> Is that true? Like they actually did? Yeah, they, yeah. yeah literally. There's there's no source that doesn't say that. It's it's freaking hilarious. Were they were they off by by a complete scale? Like like it was yeah, meant to be a rover. Like, like you know, it was like. 10. Uh, like uh, Lockheed Martin or the one one mob was saying it's ten away. They meant 10 feet. NASA went, cool, 10 metres it is. <laughs> so, you know, units matter. They do. They do. But so do descriptions. So, you know, if you go to the international pa- uh, panel on climate change, you know they're always wrestling with this whole um, what does uncertain, mostly certain, et cetera, mean. So yeah, you know, okay. uncertain is like 43%, mostly certain is 74.2. Somewhere near totally certain is blue point banana. Yep. Percent, like the, and it just gets very confusing. These, these no are the percentages I use around my home. Like, like yeah. uh, what are we going to yeah. have for dinner tonight? And I will definitely give percentages on yeah. on what we might have, uh, what yeah. other things could be. 11%. You're, you're an educated man. I know. Only talking percentages ever. Mm. But then, so, you know, a couple of... I think two panels ago, they brought in their, um, you know, okay, we're going to use mostly certain, slightly certain and link it to percentages. Yeah. So that added two columns or, you know, it's now the table has two columns, but it still doesn't mean anything. Like you kind of go, okay, it's mostly certain or 70%. Sweet. Uh, I don't know. Is, is your car going to crash into that cliff? You know, if you said, Ish. if you said uh, highly uncertain. Okay. What, how many percent <laughs> is that? Yeah, highly uncertain is right in the middle, actually. No, I meant I meant like 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 certainly not going to happen. You know, that's zero yeah. percent, very low chance. You know, like one percent versus highly certain, ninety nine percent. You know, I'm I'm taking. So what would you call eleven percent? Ah, low chance, low chance. But I mean, so they wrestle with this and they continue to wrestle with it and they add things and they they do it in good faith. It doesn't work. One of my favorites is the body mass index BMI. Ah. Which is basically what is it? I think it's the logarithm of your weight in ounces divided by the square root of your grandmother's height in cubits, and for that you get <laughs> you can get a bathroom scales that does it all. Yeah, 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 or you get that. You can get that. How they know your grandmother's height though, I don't know. But they um, and what I love with that is so it'll say okay, twenty nine, you're overweight; thirty, you're obese. So there's this very arbitrary cutoff line. It also means if you're a huge blubbery person, you can be the same BMI as a professional, you know, front row forward for the Wallabies. Both obese. Very different fitnesses. And also, it turns out it's kind of got a racial component. So what? There's, a different, there's a different baseline and then a different level of fat versus obese and stuff for Caucasian versus Asian versus okay. Pacific. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So the measurement's blunt and then it doesn't actually quite work so well. So we see, you know, measurements are based on real things, but the implications are a little less precise quite often than numbers seem. Um, how we measure things, why we measure them, what we accept is right. And it's particularly the cutoff for things seems to matter a lot. Yeah. So I've got a topic that's going to talk kind of all around this that's very current. But um, before I start, I just wanted to, as I found this topic, I thought this really reminds me of something, a story I, f- I first found uh, also on television in the 80s. So um, this is just as a way of contextualization. So the TV shot opens, it's 1980s, it's, it's a, like an everyday inner city London shopping is, is it a Is it a show that I'll know or... Um, Probably not. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. It's, it's just an eighties TV show. I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm just liking to, to imagine your, um, I don't know. What are you? You're, you're <laughs> seven at the time sitting around on an, in an eighties uh, living room. Yeah, uh, 15, close <laughs> enough. Same thing. Whatever. Same thing. But so there's, um, the, and it's, it's a, a, a show with, with bits in it. It's not like one big show or a series. Mm. So it's got this one segment. And this, so the segment opens every day in a city, London shopping district. And there's an older, well-dressed Swedish gentleman walks into a pharmacy. Instantly. It's a comedy. Exactly, and he, he wanders around the show. Don't put Swedes in a show unless it's a comedy or of a uh, Nordic noir uh, murder mystery, or something to do with you know Deep Nobel. Uh, okay, yeah. But so he's wandering around the counter, uh, wandering around the st- the stacks, and he can't find what he's looking for. So he finally gets a bit frustrated. He walks up to the the assistant at the counter, and he says, "Excuse me, 
I would like to buy some deodorant, please. And the assistant says, certainly, sir, ball or aerosol. And the man says, neither. I want it for my armpits. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I bring this up is because I love the gag and also because today we're going to talk about what makes aerosols aerosols, but not the Swedish version of aerosols in this instance. Welcome to The Wholesome Show. Thank you. Science stories and ball gags for people who sit up the back of the classroom. <laughs> Where we bring the uh, the ambiguity between a ball gag and a ball gag. I know. I know. There, there, there are, yes. So the people up at the back of the class don't have to. Oh, no, we're up at the back of the class. I got confused. The ball gag got me. I'm Will Grant. No ball gags here. None. I'm uh, Dr. Roderick Griffin. I love the Swedes, Lamberts. Love them. Love them. In your top five people? Yeah, maybe three. Wow. I've been there, man. All of them are attractive. Even the ugly ones are hotter than everyone here. Everyone. Oh, the, the, there you go, Sweden. What an endorsement. Uh, the Wholesome Show is brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of... Of aerosols. Oh, okay, aerosols. I was just wondering which one you are going to put in there. Uh, <laughs> which one our boss might on. say, no, no, we don't do we do not do that one. Of yeah, science. she's an avid listener. Of avid science. Listener. Of science. Yeah, science as well. She has to, to, to check up on what her workers are doing. Yeah, we're working. Working. Oh, chief, we're working right now. You can aerosols? Listen. Aerosols are just stuff in the air. Yes. That makes them aerosols. There's, there's things. There's things to do with aerosols that it's more interesting than it originally starts. Almost as interesting as a Swedish ball gag. So to speak. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about comes from a really awesome wide article called uh, The 60-Year-Old Scientific Screw-Up That Helped COVID Kill. Wow. Oh, okay. Yeah. Again, you're, no. d- you're doing a COVID episode. Boom. I finally did one. I finally no, you, COVID you, This is your second. Months. This is your second. Oh, what, what was the other one? I don't remember. I don't remember that, but I know you did one. I ticked it off in my book and that was it. That's right. I went, fuck it, okay. Well, it's been a long time. Let's say a year. Fuck, it's dreadful we can say that too. My last COVID episode. <laughs> So Lindsay Ma, she studied engineering at Harvard in the mid nineties. And during her undergraduate degree, she developed an energy efficient lamp. There you go. That's nice. It's thank you for joining us on the Holson show. (laughs) (laughs) I I, I hope, I hope what she did is she plugged an energy efficient light bulb into an existing lamp. (laughs) It's like, look what I did. I'm Harvard. No, she's a Harvard (laughs) MBA. You know, that's what you do. You take, you mash them up. But she's, she was an engineer, so she did that. Then um, she did a postgrad at the uh, Union of California, Berkeley, in the Department of Environmental Engineering. Cool. And her, everyone's, oh, doing, everyone's doing low energy lamps there. That is the big yeah. thing. That's what's going to solve the climate crisis if well, we just have low energy lamps. They don't seem to feature in her the rest of her world ever again, at least so far. I mean, she's young. She's you know probably in her 40s. She's a youth compared to what we normally talk about on this show. Lamps aren't you know the biggest innovation category known to man. I don't know if Elon Musk is going to do, you know, he's going to do electric cars and Hyperloop, go to Mars, and then then it's lamps. Then and after that, yeah, <laughs> it's a lamp that runs on the sweat under your eyelids, and that'll be it. <laughs> I don't know so, um, she did a PhD on how ozone levels were impacted by transport, population, and industrial development. So, ozone effects of pollutants and okay. stuff. Yep. So, she wanders over then to MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, as a postdoc. And when she was there, she collected data how you better understand pollution in Mexico, obviously. Yeah. Um, so she went on a in a mobile scientific lab and cruised around um, Mexico following cab drivers who are apparently one of the most significant polluters in Mexico City. Did, did they know? I don't know. I don't, I don't know if she's wearing a like a big false moustache and a sombrero. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I, I get it. It, maybe, it does sound like she was setting up her research project just to do the <laughs> get in one cab and go follow that cab and, yeah. and you know, collect data <laughs> oh, for two hours. Hola, follow that cab. She's um, an Asian American, so she really looks less Mexican than others. I, still, you're allowed to follow cabs, to, regardless of what you look like. I, I don't. It might be a crime in Mexico City. Um, anyway, so the research was uh, when ended up informing environmental policy in Mexico, and she proposed a means to protect the inhabitants of other overpolluted megacities, like, of course, Mexico City is what twenty million people, and yeah, like Canberra, basically, Canberra, yeah, um, pretty close. Yeah, we're slightly less polluted, but not a lot. Um, So she spent the first many years of her career studying air pollution. But then in uh, the late 2000s, as in the zeros, her oldest child started going to daycare. Okay. 
So she noticed in, at the daycare how waves of runny noses, chest colds, and flu would sweep through classrooms, even though there were these rigorous disinfection routines. No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't stuff. matter. It doesn't matter. They are they are yeah. disease vectors, those little things. Mm. That's what they're designed for. But it was also, she's like, this has got to be, you've got to be kidding me. Like they're cleaning everything in the universe. So she thought. It doesn't help when the kids are like licking each other and rubbing their snot into each other's faces all the time. Like that's what they love doing. I mean, look, I I never gave up loving that to be fair. (laughs) That's why I don't like being in the office anymore because no one likes that. It just got weird. It did. It made me, it made me think of snot porn, which I don't know if I've, I, I don't listener. No one needs to know. Oh God! Tweet, tweet us. Let us know what you find. <laughs> I, I, I'm asking for science. Um, so anyway, she watched them keep getting sick, no matter what was going on. She she thought, could these common infections actually be in the air, rather than on surfaces and clothes, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Or in the kids? Anyway, no. She was talking about airborne because they kept they seemed to be covering surfaces okay. like pretty well. And so she went and grabbed a few medical textbooks and had a rummage around just to see what was going on, which, you know, that's what an inquiring mind does, particularly an inquiring mind worried about their offspring. Yep. So she found that epidemiologists had long observed that most respiratory bugs require close contact to spread, like most of them, not just waving around in the air on their own. And, of course, in a small space, a whole bunch can go on. So a sick person might cough droplets into your face. There may be small aerosols that you inhale. They'll shake your hand. Then you use that to lick your hand, and then on and on it goes. And so she's basically saying, look, any of these mechanisms could transmit the virus. So it's, and it's also very technically difficult to separate what mechanism is doing what. How would you know? Yeah. How would you know? So let's fine for close spaces, but for longer distance infections, epidemiologists and other related experts were pretty confident that only the tiniest particles could be to blame. Okay. Okay. So a long distance transmission, like you're coughing across a train platform or something like that. Yeah. It's got to be tiny. You can't you can't yep. cough a whole loogie and get it into someone. Oh, I, I can, but I practiced in high school. I mean, other people maybe not so much. <laughs> also, not a common disease transmission vector. Like, on, open your mouth. What? <laughs> you never did that at school. No, oh, I didn't. Fancy. I didn't. I didn't do that. And again, <laughs> and again, there might be sites on the internet devoted to that, but but uh, don't oh, don't tell me. This is athletics. I don't. I don't know. I don't know all the terrible things on the web. That, that's what this show's for. So she started gathering data. She was curious to see what was going on. Is it smaller particles? What's having more of an effect over shorter and longer distances? So she put air samplers in places like daycares, on aeroplanes, um, and a mixture of smallish but not completely confined spaces. Okay. And she often found the flu virus where the textbook said it shouldn't be. So floating around in the air. Ah. Often in particles that could float sometimes in the air. For Are you hours. serious? I, like I, I know we have covered many times before on this mm. show. Uh, you know, different different people of expertise coming into a new field and yeah. shaking things up. But seriously, an engineer did, hadn't any virologist or anything studied this before about where the flu virus is. Oh, we're going down that rabbit hole. Oh, okay. We are going down, and we're going to end up playing with Corona. I mean, oh it's my gonna God. Be- so she was intrigued by this. She's like, what the, what the fuck? The textbooks don't say this. Um, and there was clearly enough of these things floating around that could actually make at least some people sick. So it wasn't, it wasn't, non, it wasn't nothing. And they weren't just sort of incidental. Yeah. They were yeah. actually causing damage. So, this, so in 2011, like I said, it was the, you know, the late noughts. It should have been major news. This sort of thing was like, holy shit, who knew? But instead, apparently all the, the major medical journals rejected manuscripts that she sent to them. Are you serious? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right, yeah. I'm, I'm, putting, I'm putting on my indignation pants now because uh, I assume, oh, mate, I assume it's going to... I gonna... hope they got knee pads in them because you're going to be banging them against things. All right, good. So she ran new experiments and added more evidence to the idea that flu was infecting people via aerosols. So she had more than one thing. She had many uh, data points and, and uh, systems for gathering data. And only a niche publisher called the Journal of the Royal Society Interface, and we all know that one, obviously. It's got Royal Society in it. I, I, exactly. I know that Interface doesn't make it sound better like if it no uh <laughs> look it might be the royal society of arkansas i'm not sure that's but that's what the yeah. journal of the royal society interface they were the only ones who were consistently receptive they kind of went okay cool cool we'll take it doesn't also so, sound like uh you know a flu journal in particular or any respiratory mm. journal or aerosol particles monthly or anything like that it no, just no, sounds that it, it sounds very general except for about interfaces i guess and and royalty yeah obviously. of course because <laughs> we publish anything on royalty anything on societies and anything and on interfaces. interfaces as well 
and this is, you know, I suppose it's quite interfacey. So apparently in the world of academia, particularly, you know, we all silo, aerosols have always been the domain of engineers and physicists and pathogens were medical concerns. Aerosols on one side, pathogens on the other. No, don't look at that. No. Yeah, exactly. This is not for you. So she was one of the rare people who straddled the divide. And as she put it, she was definitely on the fringe. I, I, I've just got to say, the years that you are quoting seem so wrong. Like yeah. 2011, like yep. this, this sounds like this should have been research in the fifties or the forties yep. or something like that. Yep. Oh. I was literally just going to say, remember this is 2011. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> like I know. <laughs> so, you could see why I had to tell my ball joke we, because we, I mean, you know. I, I, of course I'm, I'm getting, but we, we had science. Like, and I finally, we had, we I finally got an excuse equipment. to use that gag. I've never been so happy in my, well, I have been, but you know, maybe not happier. So she also had a, a, a colleague. She, um, called Dr. X.J. Meng. That's, and he um, cool he studied name. emerging animal viruses and said he remembered being oppressed by Ma. He watched her present. Um, impressed or impressed? Impressed. Impressed. Yeah. Okay. Depressed. No. He was impressed because he, he watched her present uh, a National Academy of Sciences Summit on Emerging Infections in 2017. And apparently Anthony Fauci was there as well in the audience. Whatever. He of the, he of the, the pandemic. He of the pandemics. Um. And this is 2017. So Meng says, you know, she's really a star in the field nowadays. She's one of the few scientists who has the ability to study aerosol transmission because she can use the engineering tools to study the dynamics of viruses and bacteria in the air. So she's truly multidisciplinary. She has uh, virologists, epidemiologists, physicians, public health specialists, engineers, blah, 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 blah. And so her work can help to solve public health problems. Um, so the research she did, part of the reason she ended up being there talking at this uh, event, her seminal work found flu viruses in microscopic droplets that were small enough to remain floating in the air for at least an hour, as we discussed. Oh, yeah. um, also, studies to suggest that the seasonality of flu was associated with humidity. Oh, okay. So not just people being in confined spaces when it's, uh, when it's winter. Mm, but being moist as but well. But being moist, mm. it can float more in moist air. Probably swims, I don't know. Um, and in 2013, so she got a National Institutes of Health New Innovator Award. She was uh, appointed to the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine Board. So she's currently now the Charles P. Lunsford Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Virginia Tech, which okay. is where her colleague Meng now works as well. Got her a job. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, don't know. I, don't, I think she was, he was probably already That's there. Cool. But anyway, they're, cool. they're colleagues now. And and she's apparently one of the very few aerosol scientists in the world who also studies diseases. Like very few. I am very shocked. Few. I am so shocked that uh, I assume yeah. um, there would be tens of thousands of virologists. Around Doing the, the, but not the dynamics, not the, not the interface of how this stuff floats and flies and moves around. I am. Yeah. <laughs> I know that no, we have, smacking. I know that we have pandemic brain on. Uh, and we have, we as a world have spent yeah. the last year and a half, uh, you know, pondering how these things move about, how much we need to uh, sanitize our hands, put on masks, you know, uh, lick furniture or not lick furniture. Choose the furniture. Exactly. But, yeah. uh, I, I really did assume people had done all this science in the past. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was reading this going, no, I've read the date wrong. No, I've read the date wrong, but I it haven't. must be 1911. Yep. Um, but no. So during the early Rona times, as in last year, she became quite concerned about the transmission of, of the corona in elevators in particular because it's a confined space. It has shit all mechanical ventilation. It's not great. Um, then uh, there were some people, a choir, a large choir, were rehearsing in Washington State and 75% of them got coronavirus after their rehearsal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she did an interview with the Los Angeles Times and she said the event should be a wake-up call for people who thought social distancing was going too far. So remember, we're early yeah. corona time. So come on, guys, pay attention. She also added that there's no such thing as a safe distance to stay anyway, which uh, is great. <laughs> wake-up call about safe dis social distancing, but uh, but there also, is no, there no, is no <laughs> safety. Uh, yes, thanks, safe. thanks, lady. Thanks. Uh, yeah. That's really helping. Oh, wow. But but look, it seems it seems like that was actually a slightly overstatement. What she was trying yeah. to say was it depends. Of so course, like, yeah. She went on to say like an infected runner might release more virus into the air than someone walking because they're breathing harder, but they also create a more turbulent stream of air around them, so it dilutes the viral load. <laughs> That's what I often think. I know. While you're running, you're like it's okay. There's a lot more of it, but it's diluted. The viral load is diluted because <laughs> of the turbulent air streams. Um, 
but then she did go on to say, look, runners should keep at least 10 feet apart. So basically she's just saying, look, I, I have an engineering brain. I understand these, the mechanisms and dynamics of this. It ain't that simple. So in uh, early, in early April, 2020, she told chemical and engineering engineering news. She believed face masks should be worn to prevent the spread of the virus. So yeah, we're talking April, 2020. So, that's that's a kickoff. Let's get into this notion of droplets, aerosols, and a magical number five. Oh, all right. Mm. Uh, do you want me to hold the number in my head? Because it's an easy one. I can I can hold that. I'll for test a while. you later. See. What, yeah, what I can remember. The number, I can remember the number five to like a million decimal places. Like you know those savants that can do pi yep. to like yep. ten thousand yep. or something like that. I am a hundred times better than them at remembering the decimal places. Of the number five. I've always heard this about it. People talk about this when yeah, you're not ask in me, the room. Ask me now. What's the, what's the millionth decimal place of five? Hey, uh, no, million and one. Oh, no, I can't do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, do you want? Good. what do you want? It's I ridiculous. Ridiculous. <laughs> Just ridiculous. You're only a partial savant. <laughs> so, yeah, the number five is going to become quite significant all throughout this. So, first up, droplet versus aerosol. So, the advice about what is what will be very different depending on what you're dealing with. So oh, in the medical there's world, not there's not just one like we just have a boundary. No. Well, there is in the medical world. Okay. So right. the, the wisdom and law L O R E of medicine says nearly all respiratory infections transmit through droplets in coughs and sneezes. Droplets are bigger than aerosols. Droplet droplets bigger than aerosols. Okay. Yep. Don't worry, this will be repeated. You won't. Yeah, you won't I'm, I'm, I, I get yep. it. I get it. Yep. Droplets are bigger. Um. When so whenever a sick person hacks, bacteria and viruses spray out quote like bullets from a gun. Nice. Quickly falling and sticking to any surface with a blast radius of three to six feet. So that's the wisdom. Droplets gross. They go boom and they fall from three to six feet. Can I just say that I am uh, uh, thinking about all of all of the coughs that I have experienced recently, yeah. and I'm, I'm I'm starting to put engineering terms around them. <laughs> it's not great. It's not great. Feeling happy? <laughs> uh, uh, look. I was in a medical waiting room just the other day and there was, there was a little bit where it's like, why do we have these spaces? Like they are, they are dumb spaces. This is, this is dumb. We have a really silly idea of how we will congregate all of the sick people near each other. Like I don't understand how a doctor is never not sick. It always amazes me when I see a GP and I'm like, how how the fuck are you not really ill? I know. I I, I, I mean, and I know they are and I know they probably build up immune systems that are quite strong, but still, I, I just, you know, how can how can you not just do, let's do it all by telehealth unless I literally need to touch you. Other than that, no touch what, appointments all the time. What if you just want the doctor to touch you? Well, yeah, fine, fine, I get my, it. I get my, it. my GP is adorable. Only ball gags and... Uh, and touching. Yeah. Medical touching though, and keep it, keep it clean. So basically, if you get a droplet in, into you, like via many holes in your face, yep. you'll, you'll probably get infected. So a droplet of, yeah, obviously. With yeah, thing, a droplet yeah. of goo goo. Um, so not many diseases were thought to break this droplet rule. Remember, we're talking 21st century. Hang on. So what was the rule? So if it was less than a droplet? or If it's a droplet, it probably will only go three to six feet. Okay. And that's how most diseases were transmitted, droplets. Yep. yep. Um, so measles and tuberculosis, maybe they, they have bits that cruise around inside aerosols, which are quite microscopic, and they can travel a lot further and hang around in the air for a lot longer. Ah. So this is two unusual ones, measles and tuberculosis. So aerosols, what's an aerosol in comparison? So an aerosol is five microns or smaller and a micron is a millionth of a meter. Yep, I'm squeezing my fingers together. Like yep. that's it, that's- Close, yeah, yeah, you're pretty much bang on, yeah. yeah. Um, five, five microns or smaller. Yep. So according to every book, medical what's, book what's, that Ma read- do you, Are you going to translate this all into inches as well? Because I'm like I'm like NASA, I do microns, but I know my oh, friends, yeah, yeah, my yeah, friends no, do imperial. So you're yeah, going to have yeah. to give me fractions inches, of a, fraction. No, I want yard, fractions of a yard. Okay, you know, it's a 1.76 quintillionth of a, of a yard. And a cubit, just in case the ancient Egyptians are- anyway. well, They do listen, they, they, they do listen. It's, it's a lot smaller than a cubit. <laughs> it's mini cubit. Larger than a nano? Oh, maybe. No, it's actually smaller than a nano. Anyway, micron's no, big, bigger small. than nano. Nano is the step below. Or a couple yeah, nano's, of nano's small. Billions. So, yeah, a millionth of a meter. Um, and according to the medical books that Ma was reading, any infectious particle smaller than five microns is an aerosol. Okay. Is the diameter. Yep. Anything bigger is a droplet. So it's, it's literally they're aerosol. banging up against each other yep. in categories. It's they're, they're, Yep. yep. For, uh, smaller than five aerosol, bigger than five droplet. Mm-hmm. Now... According to medicine, again, and epidemiology, only aerosols can be airborne. Oh, uh, okay. 
So the tiny ones, only the t- only the tiny ones would ever get classified as airborne. This matters. Uh, and the droplets, therefore, they fall out. Of not, air. Yeah, yeah, they were like it's like a bullet's airborne, but not fo- like but not really because yeah, it yeah, falls yeah, to yeah. earth. Whereas the droplets float around and it'll stay like a hero aerosols float around. Yeah. So this this five micron cutoff is used everywhere. Like the World Health Organization use it, U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention use it. Et cetera, are you gonna et Are you gonna say Are you gonna say it's based on some people? reckoning they might just go oh around about there rather than some science I mean, it's, it, there's science in it <laughs> there may have been some extensions of definitions and moving from one category to another that okay okay could have been reconsidered or considered at all so remember measles tuberculosis they're the only ones that seemed to have traveled that way so everyone used the five Micron cut off the health people, and and just to clarify, it is because measles and tuberculosis uh, are moving in particles that are less than five microns. Yeah, they, they get they tiny. Are, they're, they're, they're ones tiny. that can actually be tiny and do wander around that way. But of course, uh, there's a problem with this, and, and Ma summarised it this way: the physics of that is all wrong. What? Yeah, and so to her, it was really bloody obvious because she knew about how things move through the air. No, no. Obviously, they asked people. Uh, they checked with some people that know about yeah. how things move through the air. No, they check with people who know how things move in the body <laughs> and what they do in the body, not how they move through the air. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my, oh my god! I know. Again, but two no, thousands, small, two thousands, not nineteen or eighteen hundreds, two thousands. Small things float and big things sink. That's what happens. Yeah. Small uh, things float, big things don't. Because obviously, um, I'm just trying to think of any examples. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, your flightless birds, they're all bigger. They're they're all bigger. And yes, your flying birds are smaller. So your pterodactyls, they good. lived in different air. The air was thicker back then. Oh, that's true. Yeah, there was uh, pre-Cambrian air or post-Jurassic or mid. Uh, yeah, it was that one. It was that one. Yeah. So of course, what she was saying was, look, in the real world, particles much larger than five mi- microns can stay afloat and act like aerosols, depending on heat, humidity, and airspeed. <sighs> Just, just three really obvious things, really, that affect no, air. But, no, but they're they're impossible to measure. Like that you would be that's you know. maybe in in the twenty second no. century, scientists will have the tools yeah. to be able to measure those. Like, slow down, egghead. Let's just guess. It's true. It's true. She's being unfair, um, and she'd say she said, I, "I see the wrong number over and over again," and I found it disturbing. It's true. Mm-hmm. She's very relaxed mm-hmm. about this. So the distinction between a droplet and airborne transmission aerosols has huge consequences of course particularly these days oh no doubt so and so basically if you want to combat a droplet the leading precaution is wash your hands frequently with soap and water you know wipe the surfaces because the theory is the droplet will fall down and it'll be it will they can the stay on the, yep. on your skin on your hands yep. or something like that yep. uh and so you don't want to touch it onto around. someone else's hand by yep. shaking hands and then put it in their face yeah so you wash the things you wash yourself you wash the hands you're right. fine that's a droplet to fight infectious aerosols however the air itself is the enemy so of course that means you got to you got to wear uh, N95 masks. You got to have the full PPE and all that sort of thing because you got to block the air. Yes, okay. Or at least everything in it. Jeez, uh, can I just pause for for one yeah. second here, uh, listener? I don't know if you can tell by the audio, uh, but Rod and I have moved back just for this this recording. Maybe mm. we'll do next week as well. Anyway, uh, back to doing this via Zoom, not in solidarity with our our um, our friends in Melbourne, uh, but uh, a little bit along those lines. There may, there may be some not perfect health in the team right now. Yeah. And so I, I'm, I'm a little bit glad that we are not doing this. Uh, I thought you this, like it. <laughs> this physically. I nearly I, did turn up at your house because I thought this would be funnier to talk I about. Would be, I would yeah. be feeling really bad because I'm, I'm not yeah. bad. I've just got a little bit of a head cold. I was tested. It's not COVID. But yeah. I, can, I can imagine sitting there just going, I'm, I'm giving this to him. I'm giving this to him. I'm giving <laughs> <laughs> and you're paranoid, you know. You're scared. I don't want to. I don't want to. Well, I, I had the. I had my first uh, jab yesterday, and I'm told between 24 and 48 hours is when, if you get shitty side effects, you'll get them. So I'm waiting to see what happens. I'm very excited. My arm hurts a bit, and I've got a slight headache, but that could just be, you know, the stress. Do they count as side effects? I don't know. It could just be the stress. <laughs> side effects of having a day job. God, I need to retire. I just want to do this podcast 24-7. So anyway, so Ma looked at this and thought, hey, this new coronavirus looks like it could hang in the air quite some time and infect anyone who breathed enough of it, which is great news. Remember, we're early last year. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's bring in Lydia Moravska. Lydia Moravska. Do I need to remember that name? 
Moravska. Moravska. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll call her Lydia. Let's make it, I'll call her Lydia. Make it easy. So okay. Lydia, Lydia Moravska. She's um, not out of disrespect for her, but Lydia's an easy name to remember. It's just you had three names there. Was it? Uh, no. No, Enter's not one of her names. That's uh, introducing the character. The first <laughs> name isn't Enter. Um, but you know, just having my woke moment there, uh, calling the boys by their last name and the girls by their first name. You got to be careful of that. Apparently, us middle-aged white guys. Good on you. I know you're making me woke. This is going to ruin the show. <laughs> So she was described in this uh, one of the articles I read as a revered atmospheric scientist. This is Lydia. Okay. She'd spent more than two decades advising different a different branch of the WHO, who didn't deal with uh, Corona, etc., on the impacts of air pollution. You mean so, the WHO? Yeah. yeah, the the WHO, Woo! pinball wizards, and also medicine. that's their only song, I think. Yeah, I know, I know. And whenever I, it says, do you know the WHO? Of course I do. Pin, pinball wizards. <laughs> And then obviously the other great hits. And but Keith, I think they were Keith big, Ross. weren't they? I don't know. I think they were big. I've heard that. Um, so basically, the, for Lydia, when it came to flecks of soot and ash coming out of smokestacks and tailpipes, etc., who were very happy to accept the physics that she described, which was that particles of many sizes can hang aloft in the air and travel far oh, and be inhaled. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, so so they will accept the logic when it's not about viruses. Mm-hmm. Um, they'll go, okay, you know, we're, WHO, we need to, we need to care about, uh, airborne pollution. Um, obviously gets in your yep. lungs, uh, bushfires and, and cities yep. and stuff like that. <sighs> yeah. That's no problem. And, and look, this isn't, it still comes back to this silo, which will come in and out of regularly. So my indignation because, pants uh, are getting tighter. They're, 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 yeah, I mean, yeah. I thought you, I told you, you need knee pads on these buckets. So basically the, um, the, the particulates aren't biological. So they've got them in a different category. Of course. Yeah. It's a different yeah. thing. Yeah, you know, these aren't why, viruses. Why would they behave bacteria. anywhere near the same? No, they're what? not. They're not alive in the same way that viruses may or may not be. <laughs> <laughs> so, it seems then when she was talking, when Lydia was talking to who advisors, saying this, that she'd say, uh, "You should think about this here as well." They said, "Oh no, the the same laws couldn't apply to virus laced respiratory particles." To them, of course, it was because the war, the word airborne applies to particles smaller than five microns. Cool. Okay. And in medicine, it's like, duh, you idiot. Look, look, look what it says in the manual. It says it here. Don't, yeah. don't do that. Yeah. So that's Lydia. She'd been advising them for 20 odd years uh, on all acceptable. As soon as you start talking about that, they went, hmm, really? So she organized a big ass Zoom meeting on April the 3rd last year, 2020. So they got a bunch of aerosol scientists, not the Swedish version. It just makes me laugh. I love the word. I just love the word. <laughs> Hello, I'm sharing my aerosol. Um, a bunch of them who Mar and, and Lydia mostly kind of knew. Plus, there were some experts who advised the World Health Organization in different areas. And also from the World Health Organization, Maria van Kerkhoff, who is the, the WHO's technical lead for COVID-19. Mm. So chief COVID tech person, Maria. In the meeting, Lydia explained how far infectious particles of different sizes could travel. She was getting into this explanation. Yep. One of the who experts yep. apparently abruptly abruptly cut her off and said, "You're wrong. You you can't have done the science on this because yeah, the wrong. science was done or yep. not done, and we just knew it. You're wrong. Yep. Thanks, yep, you're buddy. Just wrong. And so Lindsay Ma was said she was really taken aback by his rudeness, and the quote was, "You just don't argue with Lydia about physics. You just don't." <laughs> so she kind of went, "Oh my god!" And two days before, who had tweeted? They tweeted this fact colon hashtag COVID-19 is not capitals airborne two days before the meeting <sighs> how are those pants going oh mm. yes tight it's great isn't it so the aerosol science folks were trying to warn who that it was making a mistake um they talked who through a growing list of super spreader events in restaurants call centers cruise ships the choir rehearsal mm-hmm where people got sick even if they were across the room from a contagious person. It was very loud choir, though. Speak. Like, it was, it was a strong... It was a, sh- strong, it was a shoulding choir. It was a projecting was, choir. You could you yeah. really get into the gravelly bits and get it out. No, those shriekers are basically uh, inspired by ACDC. <laughs> you know, ACDC harmonies. <laughs> That's how they do it. <laughs> so basically, the, all these incidents, all these different examples, contradicted whose main safety guideline of keeping three to six feet. Yeah, but, yeah, but that's just an feet. anecdote. You know, how could they yeah. possibly add up? Yeah, could be anything. What do, what do you clowns know? What do you clowns know? So they were saying if SARS, uh, or if, sorry, SARS-CoV-2, if COVID travelled only in large droplets that immediately fell to the ground, as who was saying, 
then of course the distancing and the hand washing would prevent such outbreaks. Yeah, yeah, that's what we were keen on. It was the hand yeah. washing. That was it was a hand washing phase of the pandemic. Man, you, you think I was paranoid? No, oh my God, was I hand washing paranoid? It was amazing. I washed shit I didn't know it could be cleaned. <laughs> Not just on me. It, did, it could be cleaned. You knew, you knew it before. It could have been. <laughs> you should clean it. You should, you should clean it. Well, I do now. COVID has made me that's, healthier that's in good. some ways. So uh, Lydia and um, Lindsay Ma were arguing that, look, it's more likely this is infectious air. But the WHO's experts apparently were completely unmoved by this. They said, if, if you were going to call COVID-19 airborne, we need more direct evidence. We need proof which could take months to gather that the virus is abundant in the air. It'll take too long to gather it. Don't gather it. Don't gather it. Don't gather it. Don't do oh, no, don't, 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 not don't gather it, but we can't act on this because, you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> So remembering, so according to public health and medical folks, if it's more than five microns, it's a droplet, therefore not an aerosol. And if it's not an aerosol, then it can't be airborne. Oh, my God. So all these two basically warring factions got trapped into a group think, a specific jargon of the two camps, and they literally couldn't understand what each other was talking about. No, I I hope in here that um, this is not all misinformation, and and we know that the goodies are goodies and baddies are baddies. It's not going to flip around at some point. They're all good people. Good. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll ruin it for you there. They're, no no one's being a dick here. Okay, good. They're just trapped in their own spaces, man. They're trapped in their, their own Their worldview, head. man. Can't get out. Man, it's just your perspective and stuff. So where the fuck did the five micron measure come from, which I know you've been wondering this whole time. So because of her earlier flu work, Maria, uh, not Maria, um, uh, Lindsay Ma, and how unenthusiastically it was received, way before COVID even, she started to try and look where the five micron aerosol dogma, as she put it, came from. Like, wh- where did this number come from? Why is it five microns? It was Maybe someone so we- Someone had a, um, a little measuring stick that, that it worked. Or they yeah, had, went down to five microns. Um, it was, yes. cut some calipers, that, 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 that'll do. Yeah. And if, if you can't measure it, then, then that's not it. Yeah. No, she went looking and she kept hitting dead ends. So medical textbooks would simply say it was a fact and they didn't cite to any original source. It was just, that's the fact. PhD students, research students out there, yep. Yep. when you, when you start getting this, then then you're onto something juicy. Like you, you're onto something. Where it's just like uh, what? No one actually has the original. Yeah, you're, you're at least onto something arbitrary. I, I had that in my own. I don't, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but like in my own PhD, I was trying to do this statistical test, and it said what you need is a large sample size. You need a large n. I thought cool. Okay. I'll just just tell me what a large n is. No, that large. source didn't tell me. Not large. Yeah. I, I looked at 15 sources, all quite disparate, and none of them could tell me what a large n was. So I finally went, all right, I reckon it's this. Large is bigger than small. They tell you that in primary school. I don't remember primary school. Well, there you go. That, that's where the, you cite primary school, large, bigger than small. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's the same thing. It's, it's large. I'm like, thanks. So <laughs> eventually she just got tired of trying to find it and she stopped bothering. So the five micron mystery disappeared until December of 2019. Someone else takes up the cudgel? Well, no, she was asked to review a paper. And this paper was by indoor air researcher, uh, a guy called Yugyo Lee from the University of Hong Kong. Okay. So he was he was doing stuff during the first SARS issues in 2003. Yeah, I would have thought, yeah, Hong Kong has a lot of indoor air. A little bit, a little bit. God, it's a hot place. Um, so he was studying outbreaks in an apartment complex in Hong Kong, and he got strong evidence that suggested that a coronavirus, because um, SARS, et cetera, is a coronavirus, for those who are yeah. totally sick of hearing about this, so, but ever since then, he, he he had struggled trying to convince public health people that this was the case, that it was airborne. Okay. So he finally, he ran a bunch of simulations, which showed that when a person coughed or sneezed, the heavily droplets, the droplet stuff were too few. And the targets like the open mouth, the nostrils, the eyes, all the things we target were too small to account for infection via droplet. They just weren't going to get there. And if they did, they would probably miss droplets weren't doing it. Oh, okay. How, so how, did, how did you do this modeling? Like just uh, he used computer models based on data he gathered from apartment complexes okay. and stuff. This is like a so CSI blood splatter pattern of a cough. Sort of. Like, I think there was also a lot of use of like um, smoke and stuff to model how things uh, yeah. moved around. You know, clever shit. Way cleverer than us uh, hippie social scientists in some ways. So his team concluded that the public health establishment had it backwards and that most colds, flus, et cetera, all these other respiratory illnesses probably spread through aerosols, not droplets, because it couldn't be droplets, what they were calling droplets, uh, uh, big, which poked a hole in the five, mi- uh, five micron barrier. So Ma is reviewing this paper. So what January- he's saying there is, is, is he's using the definition of aerosol not as, as less, less than five microns versus bigger than five. He's saying if we take it to mean a thing that will hang around in the air, and he's saying yeah. ignore, the, ignore the particle size. Yeah, it has, yeah. It's, yeah. 
yeah, things can hang around in the air and they're not just what you officially call aerosols, which are five microns or less. Yeah. Um, so he was putting a hole in this whole sort of what's a droplet, what's a what's a aerosol, etc. So when she reviewed the paper early in 2020, uh, January, she said, this work is hugely important in challenging the existing dogma about how infectious disease is transmitted in droplets and aerosols. Whereas reviewer two said you didn't cite, <laughs> cite enough of my work, yeah, so exactly. get out of here. As a historian of droplets, I think you should have <laughs> spoken about me more. But literally, so this is January 22, and literally hours later, the Chinese government officials had cut off travel in and out of Wuhan because this as yet unnamed respiratory disease was burning through the city. So the timing was quite intriguing for her to be doing this. So the pandemic shut down country after country. The WHO and the CDC told people to wash their hands, scrub their faces, maintain social distancing. But at that point, they said nothing about masks or the dangers of being indoors. Like that just wasn't being said back then. Now, at the time, I would have said, well, fair enough, they didn't know. But arguably, maybe they may have. So she still didn't know where five microns came from. But she was now psyched again to find out. And because she wanted to now use it to say, hey, guys, look, calm the fuck down. Yep. It came from here. Doesn't make sense. Let's move. So she was hoping this would help. So she had a yak with a guy from the University of Colorado called Jose Luis Jimenez. Jose. Yep. And he had on his own been trying to get to the bottom of the guidelines for social distancing. Like why were who recommending three to six feet? He just happened to be looking at this anyway. Like why is this a number or two numbers? So it seemed these were based on just a couple of studies from the thirties and forties. As uh, best he could tell. No, no, no. They must've been based on updated uh, measurements. Yep. I assume all of the social distancing yep. isn't based yep. on the fact that uh, 1.5 metres is roughly like six feet and six feet's the sort of amount that you bury someone underground. You can measure it pretty easily. It's no, got to be based on, no. based on some sort of science. It was, yeah, from the 1930s and 40s and not, not many studies. Um, but the authors of those papers, which were experimental apparently, actually argued the possibility of airborne transmission anyway which by definition would involve going further than six feet. Are you feet. serious? So, so we still ignored them. We used a bit yeah. of it, but we still, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. How, how those uh, indignity pants going now? Nice and tight. Snug? Nice and tight. Mm -hmm. So Marin Jimenez, Jose, suspected that the five micron thing and the social distancing thing could be connected somehow. Like, is there some point in history where they were yeah, they merged yeah, yeah, yeah. together perhaps? Yeah. Um, so if the six foot guideline was built off an incorrect definition of droplets, the five micron error wasn't probably some arcane detail. It, it may, this probably sat at the heart of all these flawed guidelines. So what they needed was a historian. Oh, there you go. Episode two. No, I'll keep going. Um, so Ma happily knew someone, a historian at Virginia Tech. A historian place, of guy. microns. Yep. That's all he did. An historian of, of millionths of millimeter measurement. Centimeter, mile, meter. Things that we measured back then as that small. Yeah. Yeah. So a guy called Tom Ewing specialised in the history of tuberculosis and influenza, which is happening. Okay. Yeah, well, that's the thing. That's worth looking yeah. at. Fuck, it'd be interesting too. Like, it'd be just... I find medical history stuff fascinating. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So he suggested they bring on board a grad student, obviously. That's what you do. <laughs> Look, it's great. I'll get someone else to do it and yeah. uh, I'll be near them. I'll be near He's them. Like, this is going to take a lot of forensic digging. Uh, gonna, in fairness. Yeah, no, it is fair. Grad students have more time. And this one particularly did uh, a woman called Katie Randall because her work had just been, she couldn't do primary research because COVID. So she's like, what am I going to do? I'll rearrange my, my holy cards and my PhD stuff. I said, I do you want to have a look at this. And she was so intrigued by the layers of clues and things that were leading yeah, to that's somewhere. Cool. That's cool. So she was in. She went, yep, fuck you, I'm into this. So she started, uh, uh, Katie Randall started digging around in various old WHO and CDC papers and she couldn't find anything about five microns or three to six feet. She found nothing. And then she thought, all right, I've got to find, I've got to go a different direction. How, what am I going to do with this? So she said, okay, everyone agreed that tuberculosis was airborne okay. back in the day. So what was going on there? Why was tuberculosis agreed to Because it's less airborne? than five, mi five microns, obviously. Well, yeah, exactly. It's so a 4 .9 you know, job done. She went back to her supervisor and they said, um, no, zero out of 10, send me after class. Oh. We want more. So she got into the archives. She plugged in five microns and, and tuberculosis into the um, archives of the CDC. So the earliest document she could find on tuberculosis prevention that mentioned aerosol size was in an out of print book by a Harvard engineer called William Wells and it was published in 1955. Okay. And it was called Airborne Contagion and Air Hygiene. Quite, kind of relevant. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So via various means, she got hold of a copy. So Wells, right, this guy. So 1934, Wells and his wife, who was a physician, analyzed air samples. 
There's, this, there's a reason for telling you this. And they did calculations which made it possible to predict the time it would take for a particle of any size to travel from someone's mouth to the ground. Now, listen, love. Yeah. You sit on the other side. I'm going to yeah. cough at you. And, yeah. and you tell me when you feel the cough. Okay, like, you, you tell me the stopwatch. Ready, go. <coughs> like, I know that there was no TV on back then, but uh, but coughing at each other and seeing when it lands oh, is... Uh, probably already had kids, cool, so cool there's no point having the intercourse. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But this is, so this is a husband and wife team. So you've got an engineer, yeah, you, a That's uh, why you can do physician. different sorts of research, husband and wife yes. team. You can, you yeah. can open up the boundaries of um, odd things. Definitely odd things. So according to them, particles bigger than 100 microns would sink within seconds, but smaller okay. ones would stay in the air. 100 microns. That's a very different definition. A little bit. So they didn't define anything. They just said, this is what we found. Bigger 100 than 100. 100 microns you can almost you can see, because that's a, that's a tenth of a millimetre. So... Uh, oh, yeah, because yeah, the other yeah, one's millimetres a thousand. Meter. So yeah, that's, a, yeah. that's a, you know, yeah, so uh, that's, that's, that's a... It's a pretty big goo. Yeah, but smaller than that, all right. Yeah, so 100, not 5. Um, so the question is, why the fuck didn't the droplet aerosol dichotomy pivot around 100 microns, not 5 microns? Because... So she went on, she found more experiments Wells did. So this was in the in the 30s, so into the 40s. He coughing put... through a sieve. Okay, this time, love, I've, 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 got, a, I've got a 20 <laughs> micron sieve. I'm going to cough and you I'm gonna tell run me I'm going to jump face. as I cough. Yeah, and yeah. get really or, up in the Or maybe air. it's a cough with like you've got, you've got some dye in your mouth and see when it hits your face. Oh, you'd have to snort it through your nose to make sure it was in the mucosa. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> that's a job for a grad student or a, oh, really we or a weird scientist. Like that's a... Or you're like your middle, your middle child because they don't know what else to do. <laughs> don't, knock mi works? don't knock middle children. Middle children are... are, are I, I hear they have conditions that mean they're upset about the world and apparently there are reasons. They care about justice, man. Fuck justice. There is no justice. So anyway, he did more experiments in um, 1940. So he installed air... Uh, disinfecting ultraviolet lights in schools. In classrooms with UV lamps, kids got less measles. Hey, there you go. That's nice. Yeah. But so they just have to sit there in the purple light doing their sums. Getting their tans or they're looking at the sperm on the walls. Yeah. That's what I've heard. I do. Yeah, okay. Right. It was a different time. So he concluded the measles virus must have been airborne, which was weird because no one recognized measles as airborne until decades later. So his stuff wasn't adopted either. They like, oh, oh my God. Yeah. It's, and it's, so and they what? did care yeah. about measles back then. They did. Yeah, they really I, did. I just don't get died. how you can care about this stuff and then go, yeah, but let's ignore that research yeah. that yeah. might help. You know you know why it was ignored? Uh, wrong discipline. Politics, man. Oh, my God. There you go. You, yeah, stop it. It's all politics, man. So um, Katie Randall went on and looked at what Wells' contemporaries thought of him. So why the fuck was he being ignored? Let's see what his co-folk thought of him. So it turns out the, the the CDC had just come into being and the new and very influential chief epidemiologist, a guy called Longmuir, didn't agree with Wills. That was his first name or his second name? Second name, Alexander Longmuir. Okay. So he'd been brought up in the, as they put it, the gospel of personal cleanliness, an obsession with hand washing, et cetera, and that was the backbone of US public <laughs> health. It all goes back to the freaking hygiene movements. Like yeah, that's, absolutely. It's, it's, absolutely. It's, it's a moral judgment about how much you clean yep. yourself. And look, yep. I, I get that cleanliness does does work it's not well irrelevant. in a lot of disease. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. Uh, so all of his, he, like Longmuir and his international age mates thought Wells' idea about elbow, uh, airborne transmission was slipping back to the old school theories, you know, ancient theories of miasma, miasma. and stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. And you could see why they'd go, uh, hang on a minute. No, she this, can't be the, in the air. We don't have bad yeah. air. This is what Hippocrates said in the 4th century BC, dude. Yeah, Mal air and night air and bad air, you know, you don't get diseases from breathing in nasty poo, or at least not in the same way. So, and, and look, the uh, miasma theory didn't get knocked out until germ theory in the 1800s. So it looked to him, it looked to people like him, conveniently at least, that he was bringing back this old wacky yeah, shit. Yeah, no, he was I going, get it. It's got, paleo it, it's disease. got taint. It's got theory taint. Yep, you know? it's got a lot of taint. Yeah, you see... So, Sounds a little yeah. bit like some other bad things. So, a couple. Of, it does. It does. Yeah, it does. Mm, back to aerosols. So, um, Longmuir basically dismissed Well stuff and said, "Look, you'd have none of it, but it does have some interesting theoretical points." So, but at the same time, Longmuir was freaked out by the threat of biological warfare and U.S. cities being sprayed with airborne diseases. This is in the fifties. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's that's. What so he's mean. gone. That's balls. Also, what if airborne diseases cover us? You're like, well, which is it, champ? 
he couldn't decide. So he wrote a report in which he simultaneously disparaged Will's belief in airborne infection and credited his work as being foundational to understanding the physics of airborne <laughs> oh, that's infection. Awesome. Uh, uh... <laughs> it's like, your work is shit. Anyway, your work's great. Oh my god. I know it's. I mean, I mean, there's not much. The rabbit hole comes back out again now, but oh, from here. But so the report that he wrote, that Longmuir wrote, cited 1940s studies of mines and factories that talked about how good nose and throat mucus was at filtering out particles bigger than five microns. Oh, okay. Is this where it comes from? Yeah, here comes the five microns. Y- so your that's mucus, what your mucus is a five micron yeah. filter. Yep, it could deal with five microns. If it got smaller, they could get past these systems, get into the lungs and cause damage. But it doesn't say anything about being in the air, though. Like the air, no, because it's as far as I know. The, once it hits the body. Air's not made of mucus. Depends where you are at the moment. I, it would be gross. It would be very gross living on a planet Probably. made of mucus. But So this is, this is what seemed to be going on. So when, when people look at it from the body point of view, yeah. You hit five microns, you can't hear less than five There's microns. There's a barrier. Yeah. Okay, and that's a legitimate thing to look at. Yeah. Yeah. So his concern, Lungmuir concern was that basically if someone wanted to turn a rare or horrible pathogen into a potent agent of mass infection, turn it into a liquid that could be aerosolized into particles smaller than five microns. Then it can get through your mucus. Yep, exactly. So yeah. so that's where it started to, it seems it started to emerge. So ah. Wells kept studying in the background. He kept doing experiments. He used tuberculosis causing bacteria, which could be aerosolized. He which took some word. into his mouth and coughed on his wife. Oh, God. yeah, as well. Um, once the TB, yeah, once tuberculosis was aerosolized, if it got into the lungs, it would cause lesions, really obvious lesions, like gross. So, of course, he exposed a bunch of rabbits to the same amount of um, doses his, of bacteria. But his wife some was sick of being coughed on? He- yeah, well, she was getting rid of her lesions. She was at a, probably at, a, at a, a spa, you know, taking in the waters. So you got a bunch of rabbits, half of them got roughly whatever, got a five micron mist of tuberculosis. The other half got larger particles misted over them. Yep. He put it in his mouth. <laughs> <clears throat> so the animals have got the small stuff, lungs full of lesions, the others All right. didn't. Okay. All right. Yeah. Fair enough. That's, that's, so that seeing, sounds legit. Yeah. That sounds legit. Yep. Yeah. So, so that's the thing. It's like no one's being a, ultimately a dick about it. it yeah. Was no, like, no, All no. Right. All it, right. it, it shows something, but we didn't have the whole chain here. Yeah. So eventually even uh, Langmuir changed his mind right at the, towards the end of his career and he admitted he'd been wrong about airborne infection. He was really moved by a study that Wells did the year before he died, 1962, um, where this is a great experiment. So he pumped the exhaust air from a tuberculosis ward in a hospital mm. into the cages of 150 guinea pigs. Mm. Sweet, huh? That's, that's, that's awesome. Like I'm going to get the yeah. air that you all fart out of your mouths yep. and pump it somewhere. <laughs> in a TB ward. That will be a great place to hang. Oh, Jesus. Like uh, I, I think the um, the risks of something going wrong, like you get Ugh. the pipes crossed, you do something. Uh, Jesus Christ. Couldn't you just Maybe get went it? in there with a little pump. Oh. Fuck it up then. So he would blow it over the guinea pigs and they would repeatedly, at least some of them would get TB. So, you know, I mean, not, it wasn't 100% infection, but enough would get it more than, you know. TB basically. is a guinea pig friendly disease or not friendly? Yeah, they don't, Obviously. They, they get it. Yeah, okay. they get it. Yep, they can get it. So can rabbits. Um, so public health authorities still kept saying that's no, bullshit because you don't have a control experiment. You don't have a control in your experiment. Uh, so he said, cool, I'll get one. So he got another 150 guinea pigs, but this time he included UV light when he pumped it in. Ah, uh, yeah, that's nice. None of them got sick. It's not quite a control. It's a different form of intervention. But anyway. Yeah, well, he, he did both. So what, what, what it seemed to be pretty clear that what it meant was tuberculosis, at least, could be airborne. So not long after Wells died, which is very soon after this uh, study, Longmuir gave a speech to public health works and said, look, we should be thanking Wells for illuminating their inadequate response to the growing epidemic of tuberculosis. Yeah, okay. Okay. So this is why tuberculosis is allowed to be airborne. Yeah. And he emphasized the particles they really had to worry about were smaller than five microns. <sighs> so this is where Katie Randall, the uh, grad student, went, all right, let's remember TB is unusual. It's not like other diseases, which adds a confound. It can only invade some human cells in the deepest parts of the lung, not all. Uh-huh. But as it was put in this article, most bugs are more promiscuous. They can embed in particles of any size and infect cells all along the respiratory tract. So basing what you're doing just on TB is an oopsie because TB isn't typical. Oh, my God. Wow. I know. See, it's fucking messy. It's uh-huh. wild. I was reading this going, you've got to be kidding me. How can this be so, real? And so how can this what's, be now? what sort of size is is your coronavirus jobby? 
I'm not going to call it an aerosol or a droplet, but... Uh, I don't actually know it. That's a, probably a very fair question. Ah, well, cool. Uh, listener, in, insert the answer yeah. here. Please tweet at us how big a coronavirus... Jobby. Uh, We're not calling them aerosols or droplets no, right atoms. now. No, I don't think, that's not true. Atoms. That's not true. <laughs> one one <laughs> thing I know. <laughs> I know something. So Katie Randall figured after Wells died, scientists inside the CDC conflated his observations. They basically said the size of the particle it transmit, transmits tuberculosis. They took it out of context. So five microns became the Stanford the standard for generating, uh, sorry, for defining airborne spread. So the hundred micron threshold got left behind. It just got lost. <laughs> oh, this so is so it's, good. Yeah. It's so good. And then over time, blind repetition, the error sank in, the CDC, you know, it just kept on going. It went into medical canon, basically. Yep, of it course. Just kept of course. You teach the students and the students teach the next students. Oh, wow. That's yeah. so... So at the time when they were, when this article was being written, the CDC did not respond to many requests for comments on this, on this finding. Uh, uh, they so were busy. They were yeah. busy. They had a thing on. Well, they're a little busy. Yeah. So did the discovery help? Did it make any difference in the end other than the CDC not responding? So now they knew about the five micron thing. Would anyone give a shit? Would who give a shit? Would anyone care? And there was a little bit of urgency because of, you know, the old uh, pandemic -y thing. So again, remember, this is happening for all intents and purposes right now. So in July last year, so just over, just on almost a year ago, Ma and Jimenez, the guy who was wondering about the three to six feet thing, went public and they signed their names to an open letter addressed to public health authorities, including the World Health Organization. There were 237 other scientists and physicians who signed this document. They warned about uh, there should be, without stronger recommendations for masking and ventilation, airborne spread of COVID would undermine even the most vigorous testing, tracing, and social distancing efforts. So this is what they warned. Yeah. It made headlines, no surprise, and provoked a strong backlash. Ah. How's those pants? Uh, no, no, I get it. Tell me about the backlash. Who is backlashing? Because I know that libertarians don't like to be told what to do, but who else was joining? No, this is, this is science people with an yeah, interest. Yeah, there you go. Science people. Yeah. yeah. So prominent, as they put it in this piece, prominent public health personalities, i say that quickly, prominent public health personalities rushed to defend the uh, World Health Organization. And one example was, um, I love this, Saskia Popescu, a biodefense professor. Oh, okay. Biodefense. Yeah. She said, uh, sure, people were getting COVID by breathing in aerosols, but only at close range. Because that's how it has to happen. Yeah. We know the facts not, of how things are. Yeah, and... It, and <clears throat> That's not how you use airborne when you're talking public health. I just love how much that, you know, there is an attitude in science where, you know, where one part of it is about finding out new knowledge and, and, mm -hmm. and critiquing what we've got. Another part is holding on to what we've got and until using that, death. Until death. Until yep. death. Like, Out seriously. Cold dead hands, will you ply this idea from me? Like, it it yep. has been factified and it can't be defactified. Oh. Yeah. Ah, oh, seriously. All right. I'm going to, uh, next yeah, week or the week insane. after? Next week or the week after, I will do the sequel to this. So, ah. Uh, it, it'll, it's, it's worth it because it, it blows my mind. I mean, th this is such a good story. I uh, mean, not a good story, but a good story. Well, so it's she, a science story. A it is a science story. But I mean, look, she made a great point, which was, you know, it's it's about the language. The, the notion of airborne is highly weighted. Like it means something yeah. and it means specific things to people. So and, and it means a physics thing. You know, I get it. You know, yeah, it, it a stays, physics thing and a medical thing. stays in the air versus doesn't stay in the air. Yeah, and, and that's tricky when people don't even think to talk about how they're describing it. So a couple of days later, who released an updated scientific brief? It acknowledged aerosols couldn't be ruled out, especially in uh, poorly ventilated places, but it also stuck to the three to six foot rule, advising people to wear masks indoors only if they couldn't keep the distance of three to six Look, feet. Look, okay, there's, there's a whole bunch of pra practicalities in this as well. And there's sure. a whole bunch of comms in this as well. Like sure. three to six is a knowable number and and we have to we have to still have society in some senses, even when, you know, when you're not doing lockdowns going, okay, what sort of distance can we keep people apart that's, yeah. that's practical? So and, I yeah, get it. But not useful, <laughs> given, given the fluid dynamics or rather uh, the, the physics of this. But it will slow so you, things down. You know, th there's a difference between stopping all COVID. You know, you yes, can separate people um, by one kilometre each. And yep. I, th I think we can still all fit in Queensland if we're all separated by one kilometre each. Difficult to move everyone to Queensland. But uh, yeah, we all got cars. And, and then, then I'm guessing that the aerosols won't go that far. Uh, you, you can do this, but yeah. you, need to, you need to find some sort of happy medium where it slows yep. things down. People might still catch it, but you're not catching yep. it as much. 
look, not untrue. Uh, and look, arguing over what's what's the right amount of people to catch it is, of course, one of the another one of these arbitrary cutoff arguments. So Jimenez was furious that this this advice came out, and he did the obvious thing. He started Open punch letter? up on. Uh, punch Twitter? up on Twitter. Okay, cool. <laughs> like well, it's do. yeah, it's it's the new version of the open letter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and remember, again, I'm going to reply century, these fuckers. Yeah, we're, we're talking like in the last twelve months. This is this is now. This ain't history. So one tweet: it is misinformation, and it is making it difficult for people to protect themselves. For example, fifty plus reports of schools officers forbidding portable HEPA, uh, H E P A, filter, uh, uh, particulate particulate filters. Yeah. Yeah. So more than 50 schools and offices forbidding the use of portable units because of CDC and who downplaying aerosols. Literally so forbidding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, forbidding. Um, Ma didn't go to Twitter. She worked behind the scenes to try and raise awareness of the misunderstanding. So she started talking to an atmospheric chemist called Kimberly Prafa from UC San Diego. So she, because Kimberly had the ear of a lot of public health leaders and CDC people, etc. So in July last year, she and Pratha sent slides to Anthony Fauci. Straight One to of them the showed, top or the near top. Yeah, but it was in July last year. So he was still under Trump's beanbag, which is great. Um, not the beanbag, just the whole situation. Ah. So one of the slides showed the trajectory of a five micron particle released from the height of the average person's mouth. <laughs> okay, of and course. This is my favorite. It went further than six feet, like hundreds of feet. Are you per- ser- are you serious? Okay, hundreds, <laughs> not eight. <laughs> so, like, but but you know, just to, just to, you know another thing. Yes, it did go hundreds of feet, but as yeah. we know from the light from stars, it's got to spread out all through around, and so the number of particles you'll hit at that circle of a hundred feet is far smaller than the circle at one feet. Like are you talking about one gravitational foot. lensing? No, I'm just saying. I'm just saying that it's it, it, it thins out. It thins out. So yes, it can spread sure. 100 feet, but the number of particles that are at that bit of 100 feet are far yeah. smaller than. Yeah. That's not untrue. There you go. You've said that twice. I, are you, I'm, 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 are you I'm, a who I'm, apologist? I'm you getting things right. that are not untrue, so it's good. Oh, I would say you're right, but that that uh, doesn't feel right. I feel oh, wrong, no, so. you're, an, you're an academic. You can't do it's that. It's icky. It's icky. Um, a few weeks after presenting this stuff, um, Fauci was talking to Harvard Medical School and he said the five micron distinction was wrong and has been for years. The bottom line oh. is, he said, there is much more aerosol than we thought. But, if, but Fauci didn't want to be interviewed for the story I was getting this from. So on December the 1st last year, 2020, who finally recommended that everyone always wear a mask indoors where COVID was an issue? Finally is not my language. That was a language from the uh, source. So yeah. they finally went, all right, December yeah. last year. Um, after after 10 months of pandemic. Yeah. And certainly some compelling stuff from experts who are relevant. They just weren't medical experts. Um, and in an interview, the Maria van Kerkhoff, so the WHO technical lead, she said, quote, the change reflects the organization's commitment to evolving its guidance when the scientific evidence compels a change. Mm-hmm. The reason we're promoting ventilation is that this virus can be airborne. But she said because the term has a specific meaning in the medical community, she admits avoiding using it because um, it could cause confusion. And so instead, they emphasize the types of settings that uh, cause the biggest risk. Okay. She was asked, did she think the decision has harmed public health or the public health response or cost life? She said, no, people know what they need to do to protect themselves. Well, very political answer. And I yeah. understand it. Like she's under pressure here. Um, so Ma was a, one of the authors on a piece called How Do We Get Here? What are droplets and aerosols and how far do they go? A historical perspective on the transmission of respiratory infectious diseases, which sounds again like from the 1800s, but it was published 28th of April this year. Um, I mean, it makes sense to do it. That's uh, 28th right. of April. On the 30th of April, who quietly updated a page on its website and it said, in a section on how the coronavirus gets transmitted, the text now states that the virus can spread via aerosols as well as larger droplets. Finally. Um, yeah, they, so they said it. Um, an interviewee in the New York Times said, look, perhaps the biggest news of the pandemic passed with no news conference, no big declaration. If you weren't paying attention, it would have been easy to miss. It just got popped in there. But of course, Ma, Lindsay was paying attention and she couldn't help note the timing because she, Lee, the guy who did the Hong Kong stuff, and two other aerosol scientists had just published an editorial in the British Medical Journal 
entitled COVID-19 has redefined airborne transmission. But this time they didn't have to beg. The journals came to her and said, can you you please write something? Okay, good. It had flipped. So in early May this year, the CDC made similar changes to their guidance. Um, But again, so about the aerosols, and they put inhalation of aerosols at the top of their list about how it spreads. But again, there was no news conference and no press release. So people, even under these circumstances, and even though they are actually trying to be good, still are protecting... Hedge their bets. Yeah, hedging their bets, you know, protecting you know what I their love? egos. No. You know, one of the one of the things that we do we do in our discipline is, is you talk about the nature of how, of science, how knowledge updates, mm. and mm. the the traditional theory. You know, the Karl Popper's theory that you know you get a contradictory result, and people go, "Oh, awesome! We'll update. We've found out something new, so we'll yep. throw out our old theory." And here's the we, new with theory. great nobility, agree that everything we've been working on for thirty years is wrong. And and you know, yeah. and and the, the the updated theory, you know, uh, the Kuhnian shift. You know, he says that a lot of people got to die before it yep. happens, and I, I don't think it's quite that but it does show this story no i think it is it is that it's killing a lot of people so maybe he's right but but more it's just such hard work to update people's knowledge like it's insanely difficult like you have to work so hard and so long all these people to try and update it's it's not just a here's my little bit and they go oh yeah that's cool i will abandon my knowledge people fight to the death to defend their knowledge even scientists Particularly scientists. Particularly, I think. So yeah. I mean, really, to close it off, so COVID, COVID to me, seemed, it's a bit of a hybrid. So Yu-Gi-Oh! Lee, the Hong Kong SARS guy, he said, look, tragedy always teaches us something. And so what he said was, look, the lesson from here is... Only if we learn it. Yeah, only if we learn it. But people are starting to learn that airborne transmission is both more complicated and, as he put it, less scary than once believed. Oh. So less miasma, I suppose. Yeah, okay, okay. So he's saying... We like, can science um, it yeah. rather than it just being bad air. Yeah, yeah, at least you know what you're dealing with. And he said, look, SARS, like many of the airborne, uh, respiratory diseases, is airborne, but not wildly so. So the evidence hasn't shown that coronavirus often infects people over long distances or in well-ventilated spaces. So it's not like, here's a thing that's terrifying and you can't do anything about it. He's actually saying, at least yeah, we yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he said the virus spreads most effectively still in the immediate vicinity of a contagious person, which is to say, most of the time, it looks an awful lot like textbook droplet-based yeah, yeah, okay, pathogen. Yeah. So to me, it made me think it was like kind of that wave particle duality of light. You know, sometimes yeah, yeah. it's one thing, sometimes it's another, etc. I mean, other lessons, of course, are the the wonders or the problems of having serious silos and the lack of multidisciplinary yeah, conversations. Totally, totally. The reality of doing them isn't necessarily straightforward. We get that. You don't know what you don't know. You don't know what questions to ask if you don't have any. It also of- it really does show. You know, the amount of investment we have in different bits of yep. the of the scientific landscape here. You know, there there are literally and and with justice, you know, billions of dollars being spent on immunology and virology, trying to understand how viruses work and how we can fight against them. Totally, totally get it. Um, yep. There are. I won't quite call it billions. It's probably still billions, but spent on public health on different different aspects. But yep. it's showing here, you know, in this little bit, just on these transmission pathways, we're well down in the thousands of dollars being spent. You know, it's, oh, we it's, are. And look, it says, look, maybe there are a dozen scientists around the world with mm. deep expertise in aerosol transmission of viruses. That's around the world. That's gobsmacking. Uh, and, and, and the it, funding falls between the cracks of disciplines. Too. It really, like it it really is because our hammer suited looking at things this way, we yep. have solved this problem. You can imagine a different world where 300 years ago, yeah, we might have chemistry and biology and stuff like that, but we've gone, okay, let's, let's combat diseases in a different way. And yep. we could have invested heaps in looking at this and knowing, okay, what's the moment where people catch these things? Yep. Different landscape. Jesus it, Christ. It's wild, yeah. And look, um, and when you add to it, so a basic science grant here and in many countries tend to view airborne viruses as a topic to, to be supported by health funds. So if you were going to talk about a virus, it need an airborne stuff, it has to go into a health yeah. bucket of money or application. Health versus medical here. Yeah. And if you do that, though, health agencies focus on how viruses behave once they're inside the body, yeah. not often how they get there anymore. And of course, environmental scientists, they might study waterborne pathogens, air pollution, yep, et cetera. Yep, they yep. don't focus on what happens or how the diseases are transmitted. So with the best of intentions, these people are doing different things. So the bottom line is for me, it's, it's a real cautionary tale of back, back to the beginning about measurement, accepting standards and not even wondering what it means. So five microns was arbitrary, wildly arbitrary, the decision and, and not question. But we also have like, you know, what normal human temperature set at what, 37.1 degrees yep, yep. or something centigrade. There's no baseline reason to suggest that that's absolutely normal. 0. 0.05 statistical significance, 10,000 steps are the minimum you need to walk. Spinach is the best source of iron. All these things came 
from one person either marketing, writing a comic strip, or they were just arbitrarily accepted. So that's why I wanted to talk about measuring aerosols because it, 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 the, the implications of this is so far reaching in how science is practiced and considered. It's, it's a freaking amazing story. Blew my mind reading this. That's awesome. No, that's awesome. I, yeah. I, I, love, I love that this hits on all of the buttons. It's, it's measurement. And mm. it's, it's uh, sadly, scientists with best intents, our yep. culture pulls us in the wrong way sometimes. Damn. Yeah, I, 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 honestly, I don't think there's a villain. There's just there are people who are beholden to their circumstances and their positions. I'll do I'll do the sequel for you. Uh, maybe not next week. Maybe the week after, depending on on what happens. Um, yeah. In that one, is the same sort of assumptions. The same sort yeah. of assumptions about what we know about the world and how we carve it out. Uh, but also, there might be a villain. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> at least, at least, there are villainous acts. I like a villain. The Wholesome Show is me, Will Grant, and him, Rod Lamberts, brought to you by the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of um, Aerosols. Aerosols and the Swedes. Did you did you like my accent? I got an okay accent then. That didn't sound Russian. Yeah, I won't get critiques. I'm proud of you. I'm <laughs> proud of you again. That's three times. All right. We'll be back less, next week, listener. See ya.